welcome to a special edition of Adventures in Education. This is a tribute to a person who is so special that we are going to do two programs, part one and part two, a tribute to Agnes Baker Pilgrim, known fondly by everybody as Grandma Aggie. And I have two guests today that are in a great uh, situation to tell us about some of the accomplishments. Uh, and so I'll tell you who my guests are. This is Tish McFadden. Hi, John. And Thomas Doty. Hey, John. And uh, you guys have had the, uh, the privilege, I would say, of actually knowing and spending time with Grandma Aggie. Uh, I have never met her, never been in the same room with her, I'm pretty sure if I had been in the room with her, I would have known about it. <laughs> and and uh, the, the other thing is, I've, in, in getting ready for this tribute, and even before when I've had both of you as guests on, on other situations, I feel like I know her, even though, or at least know some uh, aspect of her, even though I've never met her. Uh, I'd like to start with your first experiences in getting to know Grandma Aggie. And Tish, why don't we start with you? Sure. I, I first met Grandma Aggie about 35 years ago. I came to Southern Oregon in 1980 as a cultural anthropologist and archaeologist, and I was tasked with protecting the prehistoric sites of the Tekelma people and the Tekelma uh, indigenous neighbors throughout Southern Oregon and Northern California. And I, even before I arrived from uh, Utah, where I was doing archaeology prior to Oregon, I was hearing about Agnes Baker Pilgrim. I was hearing about the Tekelma people and how there is still living members of the Tekelma tribe and especially this one, Agnes Baker Pilgrim, who was a spiritual elder. And so ha having been working in Utah, I was working with indigenous cultures that were no longer extant, no longer living. I couldn't speak with them and I will never forget meeting Aggie early on when I came to Oregon, just in awe that here I was being able to speak with this wonderful Tekelma elder, open-hearted from the get-go, mm. uh, meeting me, a young 25-year-old, you know, new green behind the ears <laughs> archaeologist in southern Utah, or southern Oregon. Anyway, we had a very lovely connection then, and um, gosh, and then Thomas, I met you early days in my archaeology career here. Thomas Doty also was well-known, even back in those days, as being well-educated um, and uh, connected to the indigenous cultures here as a native storyteller. So it was a, a very nice link that has lasted all these years now, 35 years later. Wow. Very fortunate. Yeah, indeed. And uh, Thomas, you had an experience where you first met uh, Grandma Aggie. Yeah, this was about that same time in the, in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. I had met her briefly, I thought, but it wasn't her, it was somebody else. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, But um, there was a symposium here at SOU uh, in the early 80s on Native American culture. And there were a lot of speakers, a lot of folks. And uh, at one point, I was telling stories at this symposium. And I looked to the back of the room, and there's this Native American woman in full regalia with color coordinated basket cap holding an eagle feather. And I'm looking at her. And she looks really, really familiar. That's why I said I kind of met her already. But I wasn't, couldn't quite put my finger on who she was. And I finished my storytelling. There was this big applause at the end of it. This woman stands up, and she looks at me directly, holds up her eagle feather, points it at me, and nods her head in approval of the stories. Uh -huh. And I would find out very soon who she was because she was the next speaker, right? <laughs> but the reason she looked kind of very familiar to me is I had a photo of her great aunt, Frances Johnson, Gusquishon, sitting on my piano at home. Mm. And she was the last fluent speaker of Tacoma. She died in, in the 1930s. Mm. And she was just a dead ringer for Aggie. Oh, and that's wow. why she was looking familiar and I felt like maybe I'd met her before somehow. Oh. And from from all of this, I understand you you became involved in something that that she's very well known for, mm -hmm. and that is restoring the sacred salmon ceremony. Yeah, we have a video clip of her talking about that. So let's watch about the sacred salmon ceremony. We'll be right back. 
So when I was living in Crescent City, California, I was God called me to come back here in 1993 to restore the sacred salmon ceremony. And I finally did that. My husband at the time was a fisherman on the Klamath River, Grant Pilgrim, and he caught all our fish, caught, and he made all our cooking sticks out of redwood, because redwood, when it's heated, doesn't have any pitch laced in, in the wood. And he'd make all our cooking sticks and catch our fish, and then we came over to on the Rogue River above Gold Hill and started this uh, Sabbath ceremony. We started uh, in 93. 1994, the state fishing game came and they said, Grandma, we don't know what you've done, but there's more salmon in that river than we ever heard of. <laughs> I said, when you do this blessing, God helps and to bring the salmon back. And Tish, I believe this is one of the video clips you include with this curriculum that you've, uh, yes. you're developing right now. Yes, it's called Upriver to Morning, A Journey to Wisdom, inspired by the teachings of Agnes Baker Pilgrim. And when I re-met Agnes in March of 2016, is where she was having her book signing there at Bloomsbury Books, we reconnected there and I felt that there was so much richness that needs to be shared with our next generations, which is also Grandma Aggie's wish herself. She always wanted to have her teachings rippled out to children and she was so great at speaking with children. And so I decided to write this story, a fable, Up River to Morning, that's in her teachings and her wisdom, Tekelma ancient wisdom, is woven through the storyline. And uh, yes, and so this, the, this space that you just saw, this film shoot, mm -hmm. this is at the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy's Rogue River Preserve, a beautiful stretch of the Rogue River. And there are Tekelma village sites all along this stretch of the river, actually. And Grandma Aggie was there, and the head of the Land Conservancy got to meet her. Kathy Dombey was very thrilled to do that. And uh, it was a perfect place to have this conversation with Aggie. And we spoke about the, the salmon ceremony and so much more. Sure sounds like the perfect place, because I know that water is a very important <laughs> uh, thing for Grandma Aggie. And there's another clip from the same location, and she talks about uh, a reflection on one of those salmon ceremonies. So let's look at the clip of uh, uh, Aggie salmon reflection now. It's always amazing to me how the people were uh, boosted up about that ceremony. Oh, people got very excited about it. And mm -hmm. Remember that first year? Hundreds of people came. I know. I was there were so many people. Oh, we told spread. stories and we sang <laughs> songs and we baked salmon and everybody was just, just, re and the divers did their thing and, and yeah. it was just, it was an amazing experience. Uh, later on, I forgot what year, but the bear dancers heard of it. Yes. And finally they came, which was awesome it to was. have them there and to dance for us in the nighttime by around the big fire. And how that medicine, I told people it worked thousands of years ago, and I said it'll work for everybody here today. And a lot of people, a couple of them that first time got healed with their problems in their body. And uh, so it was a welcome home uh, gathering for our people to have the bear dancers to come. They came up from California, right? Yes, yeah. down to, out of Ukiah. That's right, that's the, right. Oh, yeah. And they still, I gotta go there, I think it's next weekend <laughs> with them. And they always want me to come and then they're gonna go to Reading and they want me over there too. And I appreciate them that they have uh, brought their medicine back to the people because it was awesome how it has helped people over the years. And I always thank God, you know, what a simple, simple gathering it was to be able to help people. And uh, I pray that when they come again, that'll do the same thing. So Tom, you're in a sense a voice for the Tacoma people in your storytelling. 
did you work with Grandma Aggie in any of that? I did. I was blessed when I started out storytelling to work with quite a number of, of elders, including Chuck Jackson of the Cow Creek and Edison Chilquin over at the Klamath and Caraway George and the Shasta and, and quite a few others, and of course Grandma Aggie. So we spent a lot of hours talking about the culture, talking about the stories, and of course working together to put the salmon ceremony back on, on both the Applegate and the, and the Rogue Rivers. Now, Grandma Aggie came to be a voice for the voiceless. And I think probably no one could explain that better than her. Mm -hmm. So let's see this video clip where she explains how she became the voice for the voiceless. I was sitting on my deck after having lunch one day and had my water sitting in a, you know, on the little table by me. My big dog, Sagap, was down on the floor by my foot. And I'm sitting there thinking, that, what does he mean, be a voice for the voiceless? And just then the wind came up and started rustling the leaves of the tree by my patio. I watched that. <gasps> Oh, the air, the wind doesn't have a voice. Is that what you mean? And so I'm sitting there and pondering about it. And then I reach for my water glass. My eyes just went right to the water. <gasps> you don't have a voice either. By this time, my eyes were running. Mm. And I said, oh, I'm beginning to understand. Then my big dog, Sagap, stood up and put his head on my knee, and I'm patting his head, looking at him. <gasps> you don't have a voice either. The animal. Oh, man, I was really crying then. And so I began to understand to be a voice for the voiceless. And so I let that to go on TVs and radios and stuff over there and to have people to join me to be a voice for the voiceless. You're watching a tribute to Agnes Baker Pilgrim, known fondly as Grandma Aggie. And uh, as you've heard, she became the voice for the voiceless. It's something she apparently took very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, she also became part, actually as a founding member, of an organization called the Indigenous, the 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. In International Council. International Council, uh, thank you. Yes. Yes, yeah, she was a founding member and uh, traveled all over the world, every continent. She has traveled with the 13 grandmothers. And they, th it's a beautiful thing to have this group of women out there sharing their knowledge to the future generations. Thomas, you know they've traveled. All, all, every continent, right? Is that true? Yeah, they yeah. have been all over the world. I was thinking that I could never keep up with Aggie's <laughs> travel schedule. That is for sure. <laughs> One time she's in France, then she's in Bolivia. You know, it's just, uh, it was amazing. I remember in one of her talks, she said, my life is not easy. She says, I, she said, basically, I have roller skates, even though you can't see them. <laughs> because she says sometimes she works, you know, 18 hours a day yeah. in, in that capacity. Well, one of the people that she got to meet in, in this endeavor is the Dalai Lama. Yeah. Let's see a, a video that shows some of that. It feels like it's um, not a coincidence. It's like the Creator had chosen me to be on this path. And uh, as we came together as grandmothers, they felt the same that it's no coincidence that any of us uh, came to this circle. If, if there's on the other side this great spirit that we're going to sit before sometime that is known by many names, um, I feel like being in the presence of His Holiness was that feeling <clears throat> of awesomeness, that feeling of peacefulness, um, that contented feeling just wilts and makes you just feel wilted. Uh, you know you're in the presence of somebody that walks his talk. And it's really great because I think that that gives you kind of an idea what 
it's going to be when we meet our maker. What a moving video. Mm. Uh, Tish, you had some comments about... Yeah, thinking about the 13 indigenous grandmothers that toured the world and did so much fabulous work for the environment and for cultural awareness, I just was reminded of one of Grandma Aggie's favorite expressions, and she said it frequently, and every time she said it, it just opened up my heart, and that is, I'm everybody's grandma. Mm. I have heard her say that many times, and to me that represents, well, first, just a lovely thing to say to a big room full of people or to a forest full of trees, but I'm everybody's grandma is so inclusive and that's just how I see Grandma Aggie's whole life and approach and attitude that everyone was included in her heart. There was room for everyone and I just think that's a message that's so important to be shared and not just the humans but the trees and the animals and the water but she was everybody's grandma. That's an important, Tom you know a lot about that in, in terms of the, the point of view of yes there's people people there's also <laughs> rock people there's tree people yes. there's the swimmers yes and i think when she's speaking of everybody's grandma she's including all of those people because everyone is people yeah mm -hmm. and there seems to be so much love that goes through yeah. you know and I, I think you know when i think of, of people's uh, experience certainly mine of grandmother mm -hmm. it's it, grandmothers are not made to uh, be as strict usually <laughs> as your parents. They're not trying to mold you so much, they just pretty much embrace you. And that seems to be her way. What really struck me was her humor. She had a wonderful sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I remember once being up at the Salette's Indian Reservation. She and I were up there together teaching at their culture camp for the, for the tribe. And we were sitting in a big room and uh, waiting for dinner. There's a long line of people lined up for dinner. And I sat down with Aggie thinking, I'm not going to stand in that line. I'm going to wait till it's done. The kitchen opened, and of course, this young woman brought out Aggie's dinner because you always serve the elders first. And I was saying to her, boy, you've got a good deal going here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and before I practically had it out, there was another young woman came out and gave me my dinner. And Aggie just laughed, and she says, it's the gray hair, Tom. It's the gray <laughs> hair. You know? But that kind of humor and insight and openness to, to everyone is, is something I will always cherish about her. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people do have their cherished experiences with her. When she passed, people came together yes. and in some very powerful uh, a celebration of lives. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one in Cave Junction and one in Grants Pass. Let's see a video clip that Channel 5 put together about the uh, life celebration in Cave Junction. Mm -hmm. A steward of the land, a beloved member of the community, a grandma to all. That's just a bit of how you might describe Agnes Baker Pilgrim. We just consider ourselves so fortunate to have known her for 95 years. On November 27th, Grandma Aggie's story came to a peaceful conclusion. In honor of all that she gave, friends of Grandma Aggie came together to celebrate her life. Everybody loved her, and she reached out to all kinds of people, and she represented the best in people. As the oldest living member of the Tekelma people and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz, Grandma Aggie's life has enough stories to fill a book. However, friends describe advocacy for Native American culture and the environment as some of her most memorable work. She often talked about reciprocity. And what she meant by that was that our place as humans is to give back to the earth. But she also said, you know, human beings are not intruders, we're participants. And that's really important, especially in the world the way it is, to realize that we are participants in making this world a better place. With traditional ceremonies and sharing of stories, the celebration of life marked just that, the celebration of one person who spent her life making a difference. Her friends say they hope to carry on her legacy and pass on the wisdom she bestowed to them. And she was so inspired by what she felt the earth represented. And the earth was her church. She uh, always admonished us to take care of the earth, particularly the water. In Cave Junction, Miles Ruichi, NBC5 News. So we have all had the experience, I believe most people certainly, 
in uh, remembering someone who has passed away. And you know, there's this kind of double-edged situation where there's the sadness, the sense of loss, but also remembering some of the wonderful things about the, the people. So these kind of celebrations probably have some laughter as well as tears. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's great that people were able, people who have been touched by her were able to come together. And um, my guests here, uh, Tish McFadden and Tom Doty, uh, knew Grandma Aggie. I feel mm -hmm. confident saying very well. You, you worked mm -hmm. so closely with her. Um, so what kind of experiences did you have when you learned of her passing and uh, the getting together with other people who knew her? Well, you know, it was so quick, her passing. Um, it was a very, very short time from her hospitalization to her, her moving on. And of course, it was great shock that went through uh, the entire world community who knew her. And uh, we had uh, actually a date to film again within days of that, that moment. But I was so touched. My friend Alice DiMaselli made a personal call to me right after her passing to let me know personally. I knew she'd been hospitalized, but I will always thank Alice for that. And um, I, I just know that, that the people coming together at the Grants Pass celebration, there was just so much collective love in that room, collective sorrow, wonderful speeches. Even a children's classroom came in and sang a song about salmon. Mm. It was so lovely. I sang a song I wrote for her that's part of the Up River to Morning project. Alice also sang, and Thomas uh, performed a beautiful original poem about grandmothers. Uh, so it was interesting, um, the, the event actually went, they expected about a two hour event from one to three. I believe it went about five and a half hours, which is just a, a way to describe the amount of people who were moved to speak. And what I loved about the organizers, they didn't put a cap on it. Let people mm. share what they need to share. Here we are on this day. And we did hire a filmmaker to capture the entire duration. And bless his heart, he, he said it was such so moving to be a part of this event that he just was going to stay the duration. <laughs> so that, that's to say that people came with, with collective joy and sorrow and left with very full hearts. I know I did kind of sounded like no one wanted to leave. <laughs> yeah. The party that never ends, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was very special. So, Tom, were you able to go to either of the uh, Celebration of Life? Uh, yeah, I was at the Grants Pass Celebration of Life, and I shared a poem. And I was there the day before helping set it up and, and all of that. It was just amazing. I saw people there I hadn't seen in, in years. They just came from all over to, to celebrate Aggie's life. So in part two, <coughs> we will see some of the, the report that Channel 5 made mm -hmm. oh, great. of the Grants Pass yeah. celebration. Okay. And we'll also uh, have you share your po poem, sure. uh, Thomas, if you don't mind. Well, we're, we're near the end of part one, and I want to make sure I get the acknowledgments for people because mm -hmm. I had a lot of help mm -hmm. creating the video for this program and yeah. a lot of help from you guys just mm -hmm. kind of getting a focus for this. So some of the people I want to acknowledge, Pete Bedell and Brian Horton, they're responsible for a lot of the video mm -hmm. uh, we saw, particularly with the, uh, the President's Medal. Uh, and of course, KBOI, uh, Channel 5. Um, Tish, I want to make sure that you get credit because a lot of those uh, conversations were part of the Upriver to Morning. Yes. So very, Along very the glad. River. Thank you. So uh, very glad to have access to that. I really appreciate that. Uh, the part that shows the uh, Grandma Aggie with the Dalai Lama, that's part of a film called For the Next Seven Generations, and that's tied in with mm -hmm. those International Council of Thirteen Grandmothers. I also want to make sure to um, to acknowledge my crew. We would not have this show without all these talented and dedicated people that are here in the studio and in the control room. And I wanted to make sure that we did credit to the wonderful life and work of this incredible person. Mm -hmm. So I really do have a great deal of appreciation for everyone involved mm -hmm. in making this happen.
uh, even in both parts, there's no way to to really encompass everything that Grandma Aggie was. Mm -hmm. But we're going to do another part of this show. Yeah. And, uh, and so we'll uh, have people look for that. In the meantime, um, I just want to say thank you very much for watching this tribute to Grandma Aggie. And we'll be back with part two, uh, also on RVTV. I'm John Letts. Yeah.